Welcome, YouTubers. Welcome to Keeping Up with AWS, the May 2024 edition, brought to you by CoCloud. Hi, welcome. I'm Michael Forrester. Let's talk about the tidbits for May because we're going to do a little Gen AI, but most of this is about Amplify, Kubernetes, things around access, and a huge but small change. Like, how can it be huge? It's huge in impact, small in scope, change to cloud formation. That's gonna just absolutely rock your world if you've ever run into a deletion problem with your CloudFormation stacks. So we're gonna talk about costing, we're gonna talk about how to provision your EKS clusters, we're gonna talk about access for your EKS clusters. Let's dive in. Okay, it's May 2024. Let's talk about number one. This is a demo. This is all about mastering Amazon Bedrock with Claude 3. Why is this significant? Well, everyone's hot on Gen AI. And let's be clear, there's so much hype around AI. It is definitely at the peak of inflated expectations. But there is substance here. And I will tell you that mastering Amazon Bedrock, especially around the Claw 3 models, very powerful. Relevant for DevOps? Yes. Only because you're probably going to submit your YAML and your stuff, you know, your other kind of code artifacts in there for checking. But let's take a look at this. Here we are on the web page, Mastering Amazon Bedrock with Claw 3, a developer's guide with demos. So worth checking out. And they're talking about the Claw 3 model family, which includes Haiku, Sonnet, and Opus. And they've got, you know, 200,000 token models. They've got smaller token models, right? And you could all look at Anthro Anthropic's webpage if you want to see that. But it talks a little bit about the difference between Opus, Haiku, and Sonnet. And so what happens is that he goes through three demos. Number one is a circuit board defect detection using Sonnet, which is cool, right? Very cool. Number two is that he's going to do a, another circuit board defect detection, but he's going to take Sonnet and pit it against Haiku. Again, both Claude 3 models. Number three, he's then going to basically use Claude as your coding advisor, but he's going to use Sonnet to do it. Now, just to clarify this, Opus is a version of Claude 3 that is for deep analysis, a little slower than Haiku, which is considered to be a little faster. Sonnet is a blend of the, the two. So it's like in the middle of the road between deep analysis and responsiveness. So it's gonna run through this and then it's actually gonna talk a little bit about the Amazon Bedrock API. Again, ML ops, machine learning operations, AI operations on AWS, on Azure, on Google is probably gonna be where a lot of the DevOps positions kind of shift. So you're gonna need to know this in order to support the AI evolution in your business. Are you still gonna ignore the other DevOps pieces? Absolutely not, stick with it. But now you're gonna add like yet another service, right? Just like you had to add Kubernetes, just like you had to add, you know, service mesh, just like you had to add CI, CD, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. That's number one. Number two, we've got GitHub Copilot owned by Microsoft. We've got Google's now named Gemini. It was called Duet. And now we've got Amazon Q, which has been renamed from Code Whisperer. Amazon Q Developer, which is kind of the sub product of Amazon Q, has a hook in into VS Code. Now, I personally love VS Code. And so this guide actually shows you how to set up Amazon Q Developer inside of VS Code. Let's take a look. If we take a look at this, this is really how to set up Amazon Q Developer in Visual Studio Code. It's going to talk about, you know, this provides chat, inline completion, code analysis, all the things that are listed here, right? And by the way, there is a free version and then there's a pro version. So keep that in mind. And so Code Whisperer is just now part of this whole Amazon Q suite. Amazon Q developer is where Code Whisperer used to be. So it talks about installing the extension, how to manage authentication, right? And this includes choices around the pricing, which I mentioned before. They've got the pro tier and the free tier. And then, you know, do you want to do it with a builder ID instead of, you know, something, you know, having an AWS account? It talks about the various options. And then it talks about like a pro, pro license, particularly if you want to hook into the IAM Identity Center, which was formerly SSO, single sign-on. And so it covers those kind of pieces. And then it shows you basically in step three, how to ask a question in line, very similar to GitHub Copilot, very similar to Google Gemini being brought in. And then what do you look at next? Like what are the things to experience or explore once you've got the plugin hooked in? Now, this can be extremely powerful, especially if you're not already hooked on to a particular AI extension, code enhancer, code assistant in your Visual Studio. Check it out. 
Number three, you may all be familiar with AWS Amplify because Amplify is this amazing tool for allowing developers to, de to deploy basically a front end and a back end and a scalable database authentication API gateway. You can add all kinds of cool stuff to Amplify. There's a new version of it out. It's now generally available. Let's take a look at this. So they basically have reintroduced AWS Amplify to host that web app and to build and connect to that back end and allows you to do things such as deploy a server-side rendered or single-page app with a brand new console, zero config authorization and authentication, lots of extra features including pull requests, custom domains, better data management, pub-sub APIs for real-time use cases. There's a lot here that's happened with Gen 2. Now, the reason Amplify is so cool is that it's one of those things that abstracts away infrastructure. Great for DevOps because we love creating paved roads, like easy to use ways for our developers to develop their apps that don't require operations intervention. We love that, especially if they stay within the security and operational guardrails. That was number three, spectacular, check it out. Number four. Okay, so have you ever, ever wondered how EKS, both at a cluster level and in a pod level, grants access to other AWS resources because EKS is already on AWS. It's a Kubernetes cluster. But the Kubernetes cluster has its own system. It's almost like it's got its own operating system. It's got its own clustering system. How do we give security context at an application and a cluster level so we can go talk to other AWS resources? Well, there's been some changes. So this is a deep dive to basically allow you to understand how the authentication and authorization works for this, you know, kind of EKS to other services integration. Let's check it out. So this is by Sean Kane, by the way, who's been around the block for a minute. Super Orbital Engineer, what a great title. So basically it answers two questions. How do I allow access to AWS cloud resources using my Kubernetes cluster? How do I allow access to Kubernetes to AWS resources with my pods? So pods are the smallest unit of deployment inside of Kubernetes. Obviously a cluster is a collection of nodes that have one purpose, container orchestration. So how do we do that, right? And you know, AWS has made some changes by announcing things like EKS pod identity. We've always had IAM roles for service accounts. We've always been able to leverage the OpenID connect kind of ODIC kind of connection to bring Kubernetes in linkage with our AWS IAM service. So what about something a little bit more advanced? So this is gonna walk you through spinning up a cluster, accessing a cluster with different entities, using the auth config map to do it, and using the relatively new services as well to basically connect your EKS service to other AWS services. Okay, number five. Oh, how many times have you spun up an amazing EC2 box. You're like, oh, I've got this AMI, it's like the whole thing's set up. I get, mm, spectacular. And then you lose your EC2 key pair. Well, this guide written by a guy who has interns who keep coming to him after they've panicked and lost their EC2 key pairs, like the, the SSH key pairs that they use to log into the systems. This is for Linux, by the way, not for Windows. How, he wrote a guide on five ways in which you can recover your EC2 key pairs after you've lost them. Significant. Let's take a look. So this is another AWS community access page, right? How do we recover your EC2 key pairs after you've lost them? There's a couple of ways. One, he talks about how to use EC2 user data, right? Which is that boot up script that the EC2 virtual machines use to configure on the fly. How do you use systems manager, which is used to manage systems in mass, right? How do you use EC2 instance connect, right? This is a service that basically allows you to connect if you have the agent installed. So again, there's some dependencies here. Same with Systems Manager. Number four, you could go into the console. So there's actually an EC2 serial console that'll allow you to connect to the console um, with your nitro based EC2 instances. So it's like a virtual console. And then number five, you could actually copy the volume, attach it to another system, change the key pair configuration, reattach it to the system, and then boot it back up. This does require downtime. Great tutorial. It's worth it just a skim and a read. It's just as a casual read, but a great way to recover your EC2 key pairs this is number five. All right, number six. You may have heard like Weaveworks, which co-wrote the EKS CTL tool to provision EKS clusters with AWS. Oh, they're out of business. Now, I don't know what happened to the EKS CTL tool. From my last look, it's actually still there, still functioning. But we've got to find automated ways other than just using a command line tool to deploy elastic Kubernetes clusters on AWS. This tutorial is gonna walk you through ways to do that with GitHub Actions and a CI CD pipeline using code build and code pipeline to make that happen. Let's take a look. So here, this is all in the AWS DevOps log. 
what they're gonna do is they're gonna learn how to use GitHub Actions to create that CI CD workflow that we just talked about, right? You're gonna leverage the capabilities of GitHub Actions to choose from pre written actions, and we're gonna deploy using this guide Python application into an EKS cluster. So it's gonna talk about the solution, you're gonna get a beautiful diagram, it's gonna walk through all the steps, talk about the prerequisites. Notice here that we're actually still using EKS CTL to do a lot of the provisioning. Be interested to see what happens to that tool over time. I'm hoping that AWS will take it in and support it or pass it to somebody else. It's just something to keep an eye on. And so the walkthrough here is we're gonna deploy some baseline resources, right? We're gonna use CloudFormation. We're gonna clone the code commit repository that has all the pieces. <clears throat> so all the steps are in here. This is a great way to learn about how to orchestrate the de deployment of an EKS system. This is number six. Let's move on to number seven, FinOps, which is basically just tracking operational costs, being able to do chargeback and attribution is a hot topic in 2024, 2023. Companies are trying to run lean. They're trying to track their cloud costs. They're trying to track their Kubernetes costs. This is happening. All right, so if we're already running Kube costs, which is this tool that, by the way, has an enterprise license and also has a free tier. If we're already running kube costs in our cluster, in our Kubernetes cluster, is there a way for us to take that information and visualize it in a quick sight dashboard if we're in AWS? The answer is yes. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So this is a repo. It's all listed here in its full markdown glory, right? This is the containers cost allocation dashboard, right? The idea here is can we visualize data from kube costs, whether it's the enterprise tier, it's the EKS optimized bundle or the free tier. Now, I do want to mention that open cost is not supported, but I'm sure you could easily make it work. You just need to change a few things. But this head repo has everything you need, including instructions about how to set it up, the architecture, requirements, how to do deployment. What does that look like? So all of that's included in the repo. Check it out. FinOps, very popular. That's number seven. Moving on to number eight. Last but not least, CloudFormation. How many of you who can hear my voice have gone to delete a CloudFormation stack, either through API, through the CDK, through Terraform, and when you created the stack, a file got put into an S3 bucket, and the file's not deleted, and you go to delete the stack, the CloudFormation stack that created the S3 bucket, and it doesn't delete, it fails, and you're like, oh, we're a subnet, and it fails, oh, and you're like struggling because... You can't delete this CloudFormation stack and you need it to go away. Well, AWS made a small but mighty change. They made it so that you can now force delete a stack in CloudFormation. Yes, you heard it here, folks. This is significant. I know that all of this other stuff is really cool, but this is a huge change to the API. Let's take a look. So here we are inside the AWS CloudFormation and notice that they now have a deletion mode where we can basically set it to force delete stack. It is right there in all of its glory. Now, this could obviously get you into trouble if that stack wasn't meant to be deleted, but there's other ways to mitigate that. This is literally for those times where you've got something weird just stuck in AWS's system and you just want it gone. You know for certain this entire stack can be deleted and you just want it to go away. And instead of having to fight with AWS in some kind of weird existential crisis, Deletion mode, done, right? So that's number eight. Huge change to CloudFormation. Now we've got a force delete mode. Yes, love it. All right, so I hope that you learned a few things in this update to AWS. Recommendation, pick your favorite thing out of the eight. Go ahead and kick the tires on it. Play with it, experiment with it, see how it goes. Would love to see your comments. Any future things that you'd like for us to focus on, let us know. Otherwise, we will catch you in the June Keeping Up With AWS update. Take care.